Prime Directive exists for a reason. Leave alone. Hello, welcome to Sound and Fury Book Reviews. As usual, I'm Tina. Today I'm doing one of my classic sci-fi book review analysis videos. So the book that I want to talk about today is Rogue Queen by Elle Sprague de Comp. Clearly I'm wearing my crown and my fancy earrings. They're real diamonds. No, I hate diamonds. They're not diamonds. So Rogue Queen. For such a little book, there is a lot to unpack here. So I apologize for the length of this video. It might be a bit long, but who knows? I talk fast. So at face value though, this is an enjoyable, fun sci-fi from 69 years ago, actually probably more like 71 years ago, because I think I read this book back in like 2018, 2019 maybe. Some of the most amusing things about it are the attempts to make it seem futuristic. I enjoyed reading it, but the takeaways regarding gender and relationships leave a lot to be desired. <laughs> so what's it about? Uh, this is going to be a little long because it's kind of hard to explain it. On the planet of Ormods, women are rulers and men are slaves, basically. The concept is based on bees. So you have one queen who has sex with a bunch of men, so you can have a bunch of babies. Her staff of workers, you know, soldiers, etc., they're all women. And men are used solely for baby making or slaves, it's called drones. When a baby making man gets too old to service the queen, he's killed off. So the story follows Eroda. A road? I don't know. A road. A worker with an interest in history who has a deep friendship with a baby maker named Antis. She's part of a contingent who traveled to visit with some aliens that have landed on the planet. Uh, the aliens are actually humans who are there to survey the train and the people. They have this kind of like prime directive idea of not interfering with the planet's wars or its people, things like that. And Aroda's queen is not very happy about this because she wants them to, to she wants to use their weapons to beat the other hives. After a classic kind of like love triangle fatality, Eroda blackmails two of the humans into help, helping her rescue Antis, who becomes her eventual love interest. She, Antis, and another couple from Earth, Block and Barbie, the ones that she blackmailed, end up on the run. There's a lot more that follows, but in terms of spoilers in space, that's kind of the gist of the book. It's kind of... there's a, it's a lot in this little book. So for a review, basically, it's a really interesting read. Um, as I said, the most interesting thing about it is how futuristic it's trying to be, but how 1950s it actually still is. <laughs> the setup is unique, though, because we're giving the strong woman at the outset, and it's not until she's described the Terrans in comparison to herself that, re that we realize that she's actually the alien. That was actually really interesting. Usually it's like a, a dry, kind of like, yeah, green skin kind of thing, but this was a really interesting way to do it. It's definitely a well-wrought novel, and a well-written novel that's designed with a purpose. It's not just some silly lark. There's a bit of a prophecy, though, that made me roll my eyes, because anything to do with prophecy and science fiction usually makes me, you know, rubs me the wrong way. But it was handled quite clever, and it was very amusing, actually. It surprised me and that I liked that kind of subplot. The characters are distinguishable and interesting, but they're not overly deep. They consist of Dr. Block, Barbie, Eroda, and Antis, along with some secondary characters. I guess the problem with them is that they're often spokespeople for broader issues or concepts and so they fell a little flat at times in terms of their personality. The love stories in the book felt contrived and they distracted from the actual plot. <laughs> there were some pretty odd choices too that the, the group made. Like at one point the group are wandering around the woods for days, they haven't eaten anything, and then one character pretty much collapses from malnutrition and the others don't seem to understand why. Like it doesn't make sense to me. Of course she's gonna faint if she hasn't eaten anything. Like what the heck? The novel was also unintentionally funny, so <laughs> I'm obsessed with the fact that in pretty much every science fiction book that I've read that's like pre-1990, they seem to think that the microfiche is going to like survive and be like our repository of information for the future. So of course there is a microfiche in this book. Um, it says, their libraries all photographed down small little cards that one reads with an enlarging machine, but I like to read in bed and one cannot hold a machine on one's lap in the bunk. And I just like laugh so hard. I'm like, oh my god, if you saw, you know, an irritator today, it would like blow your mind. Um, one character also has a notepad to take notes, like a physical notepad, like she jots down stuff with pen and paper. I'm like, that's not very futuristic. I had some history on the book and the author. So this is part of a series actually called Viagans Interplanetarias, which is what I'm going to call my womb from now on. Uh, DeCamp is not an author that I was overly familiar with before this book. He was a big deal though, 70 years ago. He wrote over 100 stories and was a major player in the interim war period, which is my favorite period in history. Uh, some interesting facts about him. He coined the use of the word extraterrestrial for aliens. I mean, what a time to be alive. 
He was married for 61 years. Uh, yeah, that's a long time. He wrote a story called Gun for Dinosaur that I really needed in my life. It sounds amazing and I want it. He took this interesting approach in this story. He he actually talks about, like, in an interview about the sex in this novel as decidedly non-erotic and non-exploitative, which really did pave the way for other authors to include sex and gender in their science fiction and use the genre as a way to critique kind of societal norms around these concepts. So, I mean, good for you, DeCamp, for kind of being a bit progressive. I mean, the story overall today isn't very progressive, but I can see how in the 1950s it would have been borderline risque. Overall, though, it's a fun novel. Um, moves at a fast pace. I was never sure it was going plot-wise, which is always fun. And there are some amusing attempts at futuristic science and technology. <laughs> if you want to read a sci-fi from the 50s, I highly recommend uh, Rogue Queen. I give it a 3.5 out of 5, actually. 3.5 out of 5 uh, Viagans Interplanetarias, because that's how I rate things now. So I'm going to go forth and do some uh, analysis of this. The, the, I'm going to talk about women, like how women are represented in this novel, and gender relationships, and race, and a little bit of LGBTQ because there is a bit of that as well. But the bulk of this is going to be about the interpersonal relationships and the gender norms and stuff like that because this book is just full of it. <laughs> I hope you find this as interesting as I did. I find this really fun to kind of go through and analyze it in this way, but uh, not a lot of people do, but that's okay. Okay, one disclaimer though. I do understand that DeCamp was coming from a 1950s perspective and that as progressive as some people were back then, they are still stilted and grew up in their social experiences and biases. I'm sure in 50 years people will look back at contemporary novels today and, and their attempts to be diverse and laugh at how bad they were. So you know what, I'm just getting that out there. I don't hate this book, I'm not tearing it apart, I just think it's interesting to look at, at gender roles back then in this kind of a media. Okay? Okay. <laughs> the funny thing about this book is that it starts off really strong and then it gets less progressive the further you get into it. So at the start we have this matriarchal society that is at war with other matriarchies, we have female workers and soldiers, all the characters except for Antis are female, and then the humans show up and we're given a crew of diverse characters, so I'm going to talk about them later, but there's only one woman, Barbie. And it might actually just be Barb, but I call her Barbie. And she's a secretary of sorts. I kind of think of her as Yeoman Janice Rand from Star Trek rather than some kind of a note taker. But you know what? She's got a job. That's good. She usually could have just been like, you know, one of the wives. There is a classic love triangle, as I said, at, but it's the impetus for action by bouncing one woman from one controlling angry man to another less controlling man. Barbie <laughs> takes uh, no time to process this or perhaps even be on her own. She just instantly goes from that guy to block. There's also this weird part where Barbie tries to teach the Avtini women how to apply makeup. You know the kind you use the powder puff? Like, I have no idea. The extent of my makeup is, like, cover up for my baggy eyes and, like, eyeliner. Um, she claims that makeup is how one catches a male. Uh, honey, you don't need to catch any males. You know, wear makeup because you like it. Like, jeez. I know. This was written in the 1950s. Okay, so Barbie's also very prudish. It's frustrating and very infantilizing at times. She's embarrassed because if Rhoda wants to examine her breasts because if Rhoda doesn't have any. And then Barbie gets even more embarrassed when Rhoda asks her whether she's going to be fertilized soon. I get it. It's kind of weird. But it's also kind of funny. Also, Barbie's on a mission to a world where she knows they have different cultures and different customs. And she knows that Rhoda has a different reproductive system. I mean, if some alien had asked that to me, I would have laughed. But to be so embarrassed that I emit a sound of strangulation is ridiculous. <laughs> like, living in the 1950s must have been so restrictive. I mean, we know it was, but like, oh, give me a break. So. Barbie, despite being a prude and all about catching those men, she at least takes charge. You know, she tells Block off quite a few times when he's being an idiot or blaming her for, you know, his mistakes. And uh, she often makes decisions for the, groups, the group and adds her input at times. You know, for the 1950s, she's actually pretty strong and bucks a lot of stereotypes about women back then as being naturally submissive. All the other female characters, I mean, they're aliens, are strong and intelligent and capable, but they're hardly in the story. Like, Erota, the main character, is all these things as well, for the first seven-eighths of the book. <laughs> I could have overlapped Barbie's slight setbacks, but gender roles in this novel become increasingly linked to biology, and that's bad. <laughs> so in the novel, Erota and Antis start to take on human reproductive systems when, since they're out of the hive. I guess the hive has been preventing this from happening. I can't really remember. Uh, anyway, 
as they start to develop these systems, they start developing a traditional gender relationship. And the more that this progresses, the more Eroda drops her agency in the relationship. And I mean, she's not regressed to being like a servant to Antis, but for example, Antis is really bossy with her and Avoda was surprised, first by his vehemence, second by the fact that she did not mind being bossed so much as she would have before her change. So this kind of reinforces the idea that, you know, men are in charge and bossy women are unnatural, that kind of thing. And it gets worse. Later on, Eroda's talking to Barbie and she says, and the curious thing is that whereas I used to be the dominant one of the pair, Antis now makes all the decisions. Of course I know more about the world than he, and he knows I do, so we play a little game. I make a suggestion, very tentatively, so as not to sound as if I were commanding him. And he grunts and he says he'll think about it. The next day he bursts out, beautiful, I've just had the most wonderful idea, and goes on to repeat my suggestion in the very words I've used. Isn't that amazing? No. No. Eroda, <laughs> it is not. <laughs> you just explained the biggest problem women face in the workplace with their ideas being stolen and gaslighting, and it's extremely frustrating. Eh, it's so annoying that Barbie and Eroda find that this lack of respect from their partners, because that's what it is, is a joke. Like, they think it's funny. Um, Eroda even talks about how much she loves the new gender norm she's naturally falling into. I'm like, what? Like, girl, you love being seen and not heard? Like, give me a break. I don't know, it's that... I wonder though, like, is this episode and similar ones meant to show how stupid it is when de when guys did this to their wives? Or is it meant to be funny? I'm not entirely sure whether it's just like a satire or if it's to make a point or whether it's just like a joke about like marriage at the time when this was written. Like, the fact that I can't tell though <laughs> makes me more frustrated because the book was heading in such a like a non-sexist direction and then all of a sudden it just did this weird 180. There's also my favorite 1950s, 60s demeaning act. So men in the 50s and 60s are always slapping women on the ass. You see it in movies all the time. It happens in books of this time period a lot. It's either done as a joking way to like punish them for something mild they did wrong, or it's like a territorial, territorial ownership thing. Either way, it's degrading and it always annoys me. It just, it drives me bonkers and I hate it. Stop it, stop it, dudes from the 60s, stop it. Anyway though, when it comes to women in this story, a great thing is yet again ruined by humans. <laughs> the Prime Directive exists for a reason. Leave it alone. Let the Queen's rule. I'm going to talk a little bit about race in this book because it's interesting. So the Aptini don't appear to have any racial biases and the human crew is diverse. The main human characters are both white, but there is a black captain of the ship, there's an Indian character, there's reference to someone, reference to someone named Lobos, who I'm assuming is Latinx, and an Asian character. And none of these appear to be in service roles or any less capable than anyone else, which tends to happen in books from this time period. That was a surprise. I was expecting maybe like one person of color. So it was really great that this book went out of its way to show that that's not the case anymore in this alternate world, I guess. Um, there's some weird comments made though that are kind of, that weren't like really racist. They were just weird and stereotypical and I'm not even sure what the heck they're supposed to mean because I'm not really up on 1950s stereotypes, I guess. Uh, there's also the Asian character named Kang and he speaks in broken English, though it's not explained why he would. Like it's not, we're not told whether the crew is from different parts of Earth or different Earth colonies or what. I mean, he has a cool job, like he's the helicopter pilot, so that's, at least he gets that. This doesn't really deal with race, but there's a hilarious passage about communism. <laughs> We once had a sect or a cult on terror called communists who believed as you do that love of the community should take precedence over all others, but their collectivist love seems to involve such fanatical hatred of everybody else and such implicit or implicated determination to impose their system on the world that we had to exterminate them. Exterminate them? Oh my god. Oh, the Cold War. The good old days when we only had to worry about nuclear war. You know, not terrorism or global warming. Yay. And I'm briefly going to talk about LGBTQ uh, representation in this book because there's not a lot. Uh, there aren't any gay characters in the human crew, but I would argue that Varda, one of the Avtini women and Eroda's like best friend, is coded as a lesbian. While all the worker Avtini women are non-sexual, Varda has a certain love for Eroda that comes off as stronger than friendship or sisterhood. <laughs> She's always professing that she loves Eroda more than anything. She does everything she can to make Eroda ha happy and safe. Yeah, and then in the end, uh, Eroda suggests that Varda become a queen, and Varda says, What? To become a bulgy, functional female like you, and submit to the horrid embraces of some drooling drone? No thank you. Obviously, like, 
this is obvious. <laughs> and I love Varda and she's my favorite character. And that's the end. So thank you for watching. I hope you found that as interesting as I did. I really love when I come across a book for like an old book like this and there's so much to talk about, especially if one is a tiny little book like this and when it's also an enjoyable book to read. I, I really do like this book and uh, I highly recommend it if you want something kind of kind of weird and quirky from the 1950s. I think it's 55. Um, 51. Jeez. We're in like Korean War territory here. Going back. 60 years ago? No, 70 years ago. Holy shit. Anyway, thanks for watching. Bye.